used to be a nation of farmers, but now it's less than 2% of the population in the United States. And so a lot of us don't know what it takes to grow food. Over 12,000 years ago, people began planting and saving seed. Agriculture flowered and civilizations were born. In China, thousands of varieties of rice were grown. Over 5,000 kinds of potatoes were cultivated worldwide. In the U.S. alone, more than 7,000 varieties of apples were grown in the 19th century. In the 20th century, the face of farming underwent a radical change. The manufacture of nitrogen-based bombs during World War I led to the development of nitrogen-based chemical fertilizers. Nerve gas, developed during World War II, was slightly modified to make insecticides. DDT was the hero of its generation. New technologies promised higher yields, increased food production, cheaper prices, and greater availability. By the mid 20th century, these technologies, along with new developments in plant breeding, led to the Green Revolution. I think the people who first imagined the Green Revolution had good hearts. Lots of people are starving around the planet. That's long been the case in human civilization. Their thinking was if we could just systematize agriculture like we did industry in the 1800s and bring it worldwide, bring one system that works, we can solve the problems that people have long had with agriculture. The next several decades saw a remarkable increase in production. Year after year, huge fields were planted with only one variety of crop. These monocultures created an ecological vacuum that insects and disease could exploit. This uniformity has led to some of the greatest agricultural catastrophes of mankind. In the mid-1800s, very few varieties of potatoes were cultivated in Ireland. When they became diseased, one million people died. When the same potato blight attacked Peru, they suffered fewer consequences. Today, only four varieties of potatoes are widely grown. 97% of the varieties of vegetables grown at the beginning of the 20th century are now extinct. Genetic uniformity leads to an increased vulnerability to insects and disease. Farmers found themselves trapped on a pesticide treadmill. The more they sprayed, the more they had to spray. The increased use of fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides increased costs, polluted water, and created health risks. Then in the 1970s, Monsanto introduced Roundup. Because of its ability to kill most weeds, it became one of the most popular herbicides in history. In the mid-1990s, building on technologies that use gene splicing, the Green Revolution turned into the Gene Revolution. Capitalizing on the new technology, Monsanto genetically modified its seeds to be Roundup ready. Normally, Roundup kills anything green. But if the plant is Roundup ready, when it is sprayed, it doesn't die. Now the company that sells you the herbicide also sells you the seed. 
a generation ago, farmers would seed a crop and use a, a herbicide when necessary, but often they wouldn't need to use a herbicide. And today you have a crop that right when it goes in the ground is designed to be sprayed. With Monsanto's BT corn, the corn itself is registered as an insecticide. This is because every cell has been engineered to manufacture BT, a natural bacterial toxin. If a corn borer eats any part of the plant, it will die. And now that we have genetic engineering, we're not just you know, putting chemicals in this food, we're actually industrializing the food at the genetic cellular level. One of the most controversial aspects of the gene revolution is the patenting of seeds. There was a very good reason why for you know, virtually 200 years uh, the Patent Office and Congress did not allow for the patenting of life. The right to patent is guaranteed by Article 1 in the Constitution. Food crops were deliberately excluded from patenting on moral grounds. Starting in the 1930s, plant breeders were given the right to patent their work. But the patent protection did not extend to the subsequent generations of seeds. You know, clearly when you patent a tennis racket, let's say, with a new sweet spot, you can describe that very accurately to the patent office. But how in the world can you describe a whole plant, much less generations down when that's changed and mutated? But in 1978, Dr. Ananda Chakrabarty took the first living organism to the patent office. Chakrabarty was an engineer for General Electric, and he uh, created an oil-eating microbe and tried to get it patented. And the U.S. Patent Office said, no way. We do not allow you to patent parts of nature. You know, if you have a tennis racket or a toaster, you can patent that, but you can't patent a part of nature. Uh, but General Electric and, and Chakrabarty were very insistent. They took it all the way to the Supreme Court. And at one vote majority decision, they said, you can patent this genetically engineered microbe. Interestingly uh, enough, uh, this oil-eating microbe was never used because even though it did uh, eat oil and oil spills, it apparently ate a lot of other things for dessert. The floodgates were now open for genetic engineering. During the Reagan administration, they said, let's patent animals. And then human genes and human body parts. I think what the companies would like to say is, we are patenting the gene. And wherever that gene goes, we own anything that we put it in. If it goes into a plant, we own the plant. If it goes into an animal, we own the animal. Uh, they might even say around the world, if it goes into a human being, we own that human being. There would be some constitutional problems with that in the United States. But they would, clearly would want their patent to follow the gene. The issue of patenting life has never been voted on by the people or the Congress of the United States. It actually means giving corporations incredibly the power to own, control the species of the Earth. While corporations were patenting everything under the sun, they were also busy in another area. Starting at about 1995, the stock market was running up and Monsanto was buying up uh, seed companies and DuPont was buying Pioneer and there was this, basically, the U.S. pesticide industry bought the seed industry for all intents and purposes. Monsanto spends $8 billion buying up seed companies. By the 1990s, corporations begin patenting not only GMO seeds, but seeds that haven't been genetically engineered. The only requirement is that they have not been patented before. It's one of the wonderful things about what our government has done for the years with seeds is trying to save seeds so that we can preserve biodiversity. What companies have done is gone into those seed banks, find the seeds that aren't patented, and patent them. And as long as they're the first person at the patent office, they get the patent. It is estimated that Monsanto owns 11,000 patents. Why would corporations do this? Because then they can take the one seed they want to use to replace all these seeds, and it will own the marketplace. In Canada, the question of patenting landed directly in Percy Schmeiser's field. Uh, 
I've been farming for 53 years and in those years I've grown uh, mostly wheat, canola, oats and peas. This field has had wheat and, and the field behind me has canola in it or rapeseed as it is known in Europe. When our grandparents came to this country there was no such thing as chemical companies or seed companies and they had to rely and develop their own seed, borrow seed from their neighbors or bring it from Europe with them. Percy was known in this part of Canada as a seed developer and a seed saver. I would say that our best grains, our best seeds have not been developed by research people or scientists, they have been developed by farmers. In 1997, Percy sprayed Monsanto's Roundup around the power poles and ditches as he had done for years. Some canola plants did not die. I thought initially that some of those plants didn't die because I had been spraying year after year after year with Roundup in the same area and companies warn you, you shouldn't spray every year because you could develop a resistance. Monsanto found out about it and they went on my land that I farm without my knowledge, without my permission and took plants or seeds and said some of that was Monsanto's Roundup Ready canola. In August the 6th of 1998, they launched a lawsuit against me. Monsanto claimed that Percy had illegally obtained their genetically modified canola without a license and had infringed on their patent. Patents historically have been for things like, I've used the example of a carburetor, well, the carburetor doesn't get up one day and start replicating itself everywhere and introducing itself into your car so that all of a sudden you have somebody else's carburetor one morning and then you get sued for patent infringement. So that's the unique nature of this type of technology that uh, once you've unleashed it into the environment, uncontrolled and unconfined, it will spread everywhere. Before the main trial, Monsanto withdrew then all their allegations against me that I had ever obtained a seed illegally. And they went on to say that it didn't matter how the seed got on to my land, I still infringed on their patent. Because my land is on the east side of the road, the main road, the prevailing winds here are from the west. So it would be natural for the canola that blew off of trucks to land in the field here. In fact, one farmer uh, told me that when he drove past my land uh, hauling a Roundup Ready canola, his tarp had broken and he estimated he lost enough past my two miles of land to see 2,000 acres. Well, I think one of the uh, biggest issues in the case is uh, where to draw the line between the people and the companies who produce and come up with this new technology the line ended up being drawn way into the farmers' fields. And our contention was the line should clearly be drawn such that farmers have a right to continue to farm. They should be able to save and reuse their own seed. They should be able to buy seed, conventional seed, from their neighbors as they've had in the past without having to worry about uh, whether they're infringing somebody's patent now. 1999, when I went to uh, seed uh, my canola fields, I was advised by my lawyer not to use my own seed again because I now knew it was contaminated by Monsanto's genetic altered canola. And it was seed that was adapted to this region and grew quite well because it was resistant to various diseases. Percy destroyed over 1,000 pounds of seed that he and his wife had developed over decades. The lawsuit and my loss of the, my seeds was the hardest thing that we could have ever happened to us. Now here, Monsanto comes along. What we worked for all these years, they just want to take it away just like that from us. I could never do that to, the, uh, to go into their office and take anything, I would be prosecuted. And they can just come and, and do anything to the farmers just like 